Readings from the Mass of the Sacred Heart of Jesus on this solemnity. The epistles taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2. Brethren, to me, the very least of all saints, there was given this grace to announce among the Gentiles the good tidings of the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to enlighten all men as to what is the dispensation of the mystery which has been hidden from eternity in God, who created all things, in order that through the church there be made known to the principalities and the powers in the heavens the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him we have assurance and confidence accessible to God through faith in him. For this reason I bend my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth receives its name, that he may grant you from his glorious riches to be strengthened with power through his spirit under the progress of the inner man, to have Christ dwelling through faith in your hearts, to that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, height, and depth, and to know Christ's love, which surpasses knowledge, in order that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is taken from St. John, chapter 19. At that time, the Jews, since it was a preparation day in order that the bodies might not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was a solemn day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. The soldier therefore came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. For these things claim to pass, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall you break. And again, another scripture says, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Please be seated. A few announcements for this Sunday. And one of those is the blessing of articles. The blessing of articles normally is done on the first Sunday of the month. But that was not done last Sunday, I understand. So I will bless the articles this Sunday after Mass. So there will not be adult catechism today, but rather the blessing of articles. I will be saying Mass here tomorrow morning and on Monday at 8 a.m. I have to stay over to take care of a few duties on Monday. So keep that in your prayers, my different duties. But do be mindful, you're welcome to the ADM Mass here tomorrow morning. We want to pray for Jim Haddock. He's a former St. John Bosco Mission Coordinator <coughs> from years back. I knew Jim for quite a few years there. Um, well, since I was first assigned to, to Venita back in 2012. And him and his wife, they had started up their little hotel there with the yurts. If ever you get a chance to visit, those are unique. You can stay in the yurt. But I wish for you to pray for Mr. Jim Haddock, who has been uh, diagnosed and has cancer of the esophagus. Um, I know how these things go. These cancers are terrible on persons' bodies, and we need to pray for his perseverance. And even we can pray for his good health, but pray most of all that he accepts God's will and that he perseveres through his suffering. We're going to start praying a Holy Rosary of Reparation on the Holy Hour, sorry, of Reparation on First Fridays. Um, it's a good thing to do. Every chapel should do a Holy Hour on First Friday, if not all the adoration, like we do in some places with the Blessed Sacrament. We stopped doing that in Arcadia at the time of the uh, lockdowns, and then afterwards it just got too dangerous. We would have to have security all day um, in those parts so that we don't have the riffraff passing through. But nonetheless, the Holy Hour every first Friday is a good idea, especially this month of June. We did have one already in Arcadia, and I'm thinking you had one here too. 
And so that being the case, it's a good start. So it's a good thing to continue and whenever you can to make a holy hour. But that's a special day to do so. First Fridays in reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus for sin. Our sins and the sins of others. We also want to do our novena to Our Lady Help of Christians for a new St. John Bosco Mission Chapel. That will start this Sunday and then end on June 17th. So please be aware of that. It would be good to do this novena to Our Lady Help of Christians. And on that note, um, obviously you've known in the past that I have been aware, have been pursued, at least briefly, some properties that have come available, but then as soon as we show an interest in them, they're gone. So I don't want that to be the case with something recently that's come to my attention, which I'm going to check out tomorrow. So I ask for your prayers for that, but I also ask for your generosity. And in, connect, in conjunction with that, you see, uh, since we are in the announcements, I'm going to show you, this is a, a recent flyer that came from uh, Assumption <coughs> Academy building campaign. Now, this is something we could do also for our future campaign. It's a good idea. But I know that this goes all over the United States and goes to all of our chapels and priories. Now, I cannot limit you in donating to this cause, but I can insist that whatever you give, you have to proportionally give to St. John Bosco Mission. So if you give anything to this type of campaign outside of our chapel, then you have to be willing to give the same here in the chapel. <laughs> because charity starts at home. How can we go around the United States building up other places and not take care of our own place. So we want be mindful of that. We're always able to give wherever we'd like, but we should also remember that we give just as much to our chapel or our church. So anyway, we could come up with a similar flyer. I think uh, Mr. Johnny Guerin and I have some ideas on that, so we can always do that. Um, I think there's one other thing, but again, just be mindful of the prayer of reparation at the end of Mass, and then a reminder to the men, we still need five men to sign up for the baseball game. It should turn out to be quite the show of men. Um, I guess you could go hiring some of the local <laughs> pros. Um, get a little money together, you could hire a couple of pros, then Father Daly would love that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, help a Christian. Pray for us. So dear servers, dear faithful, uh, three parts to my sermon today, which is really three points. Three parts makes it sound like three sermons. I don't want to scare you like that but three points on the Sacred Heart, on this time of the Sacred Heart. And first of all is to draw your attention to the encyclical of Pope Pius XII when he wrote his Tarietis Aquas. And it's very important for us to know that document. Many don't, and I can <laughs> hardly not blame you because it's not quite as well known or as, I would say, needed as the encyclicals on modernism or liberalism. This is rather a very positive one and a very important one for the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Tariatis Aquas was given by Pope Pius XII as an encyclical letter to the priests and bishops, bishops mainly the clergy, and then when he teaches the clergy, he wants them to go teach the faithful. And in this encyclical letter, he is emphatic about how this has been a devotion of the church for many years, as often these devotions are, all the way from the time of our Lord on the cross. Our Lady, St. John, they're all devotees of the Sacred Heart, and we see that in the Gospels. But also, over time, it's grown to the point where he felt the need to write on it, to clarify, and make certain that all of the clergy all of the faithful know that this is a good devotion to hold on to and that it's very necessary for our modern times. You can see in history, especially with the Jansenism, that it's really the devotion to the Sacred Heart that give, gave back or kept the church in an equilibrium. Instead of falling into extremes, like Jansenism was wont to do, is drive everybody into a strictness that is really closer to Manichaeism, and the errors of France at that time. 
So really, the devotion to the Sacred Heart gives a person the equilibrium. It helps them get out of scruples and stay away from laxity. It's a very beautiful devotion for young people, teenagers who really struggle with their growing up, the struggles of soul and of confidence, the struggles of the mercy of God, etc., etc. This devotion to the Sacred Heart is very important to avoid scrupulosity and to avoid laxity. So few really have a good devotion to the Sacred Heart. And I think it's something that needs to grow even further. This was already written back in the 1950s, so from then until now, there's been a lot of devotion to the Sacred Heart, especially, as some of you know, by the consecration and enthronement of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But still, it's too far removed. It's too unknown to a lot of people, and we need to improve on that. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the center of our life. He's really there in the Blessed Sacrament in our tabernacle. Right there under the species of bread and wine, the priest is looking at the heart of Jesus. And so we need to keep that ever for foremost and first in our devotions, this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And it's very good for priests. The priests who are devoted to the Sacred Heart have a big, very large, very important impact on souls. Our Lord promised that. It was one of the 12 promises to Margaret Mary Alacoque that the priests who are dedicated, those who are devoted to the Sacred Heart, they will have the ability to touch hard hearts. And such is the case even for you, fathers and mothers, lay people, following the example of the priests, devoted to the Sacred Heart, where there's an image of the Sacred Heart, our Lord brings peace. So you can read that letter, an encyclical letter. There's a little part that I will read to you today because I think it's important about this physical heart of our Lord. And that's a, an important point of today is that <clears throat> never before in the history of God's providence has there been a physical heart that we can adore and worship without idolatry. Now we do. It's God's heart. Ever since our Lord Jesus Christ became man, this is his physical heart, the heart of God. God never had that before. Mm -hmm. If there's a change in God, is that he assumed to himself one of our hearts and made it his own. He took one of the hearts, well, made it. He made this physical heart for himself, and now it's God's heart. And we can actually adore and worship the heart of God. What a beautiful devotion, what a beautiful reality. Hence, there can be no doubt that Jesus Christ received a true body, and that all the affections proper to the same, like for us, among which, which love surpassed all the rest, it is likewise beyond doubt that he was endowed with a physical heart like ours. From without this noblest part of the body, the noblest part of the body, the ordinary emotions of human life are impossible. Therefore, the heart of Jesus Christ, hypostatically united to the divine person of the word, eternally beat, or certainly beat, sorry, certainly beat with love with the other emotions. But these, joined to a human will full of divine charity, and to the infinite love itself, which the Son shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit, were in such complete unity and agreement that never among these three loves was there any contradiction or disharmony. And that's the beautiful thing about this. The Holy Trinity has loved each other for eternity. This trinity has loved itself perfectly. But then what did it do? It reached out and pulled in this part of our nature and made it part of their own, this heart. And it didn't change them. Hypostatically, we say it was joined to, like the priesthood. We priests join in our Lord's priesthood, hypostatically. There's one other person who does that, the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's these few persons who join in this mystery uh, of the Godhead by extension that wasn't original but more than accidental so it's, it's quite a mystery something that God will reveal to us in its fullness when we go to heaven but nonetheless we can talk about this heart being a real heart, a physical heart that we can adore and we must be very devoted to him that and many other little mysteries and great truths Pius XII talks about in this encyclical and the true devotion the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is really a devotion for our age and 
that keeps us out of extremes. Second part of my sermon today <clears throat> is the Epistle and Gospels, because as you know, dear faithful, this is the third Sunday after Pentecost, even though the solemnity takes priority, the priests, the religious still say the office of the third Sunday after Pentecost. And it's interesting to note how all of the readings come together. How can it not? Jesus is the author. God is behind it all. Of course it fits together. But in particular, the third Sunday after Pentecost talks about the shepherd. The shepherd who goes after the lost sheep leaves the 99 in the desert and goes to get the one sheep that was missing or straying. It's also the same gospel that tells us about the groat, the woman who had this means of exchange, this thing amongst a few that she lost and went rolling away and hid underneath the furniture or somewhere where it was out of sight. And she was so, oh, so upset that she lit all the candles and she swept everything and then she needed the help of others to celebrate. It was so important to her, and she did find it. All of that to say, that's exactly what the Sacred Heart does for us. The Sacred Heart has gone to great lengths. Jesus himself has gone to great lengths to pull us into the fold, to bring us to where he wants us. Even if it's not so much always serious sin, but imagine where we were before being brought into the church. Even if we're just a little baby, a little baby born into this world is affected, infected by original sin. Imagine the difference where that baby is and then where Jesus, the Good Shepherd, brings it by baptism. An incredible difference. An incredible reality that it didn't have by itself. Or maybe it is those souls who stray away from God. And then our Lord, the Good Shepherd, goes after them. He can leave the sheep. We would often wonder why he'd do that, because sheep are known to start wandering out more and more. But in a way, sheep, when they're banded together in a group, they're by that group protected. Those of you who may have dealt with sheep or with animals, <clears throat> if you keep them tight, then the predators have a hard time getting in to attack them. If they start loosening up, then it's easier to get on top of them, to eat them, separate them and eat them. So you keep them tight, whether that's a pen, a sheep fold as we call it, or whether it's just simply tight together, where they usually will, even in weather, bad weather, they do the same. See, they, they insulate one another and put their heads down, and it's just like, <laughs> like soldiers in a battle with shields. And so this one sheep had gone off, and so our Lord went after it. Those others, he could leave because they were safe for the moment. This one, not so safe. Could be devoured by the wolves. And even in the readings of today, we hear, not well, today's as in the solemnity of the Sacred Heart, but in today's third Sunday's Epistle and Gospel, we hear there written that the lion goes about roaring. The devil, as a lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. And that's another thing we have to consider. The Sacred Heart wants us close together. If we start to get separated by sin, falsehood, error, whatever it is, we start straying away from the church, then it's easy for the devil to pick up that soul. But if it stays close, then it's protected by the church. So it's just something to think about, even in our own spiritual life. We have the ability. God has given us, through baptism, all of these graces, and this character, this character stands so, so strong against the devil. And then, of course, you can imagine if someone's confirmed or given the the priesthood, the holy orders, the soul keeps getting stronger and stronger against the attacks of the devil or against his approaches. And so we are strong. A baptized person is very strong against the devil. The question is, you, is when we start opening up that armor, like I was saying with the sheepfold. Once we start straying away from the protection, then we start to create a crack and the devil can come in need to be strong always so we have the choice it's our will do we want the devil to come in or not 
And even when our Lord is going after that sheep, we know it to be true in our lives. If we take the sheep as a soul and the shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is always in pursuit of souls, the soul can say, I don't want you, I don't want you. And it can keep going and going and going and further and further and further. But he never stops pursuing. He's like a hound. There's only one way he stops pursuing, and that's the question of life and death. When we're at the end of our life and we have the choice of eternity, heaven or hell, and we die and we can't act anymore, our Lord stops. Of course he does. Because it's based on our free will. When we no longer can use our free will in this life to act, and Jesus the pursuer, Jesus the shepherd, Jesus the hound of heaven stops. That's the end. The judgment has been made. But until then, he doesn't stop. I mean, we think of the worst people. We would say to ourselves, because it says even today's gospel. No, no. It's in the epistle. What is the breadth, length, height, and depth to know Christ's love, which surpasses all knowledge? Think of that. Christ's love is above all knowledge. Our knowledge says, our reason says, that guy's a fool. That guy's an enemy. That guy's wretched. I want nothing to do with him. He will never save his soul. We would say that. We can say that. Because that's where our minds are very limited. Well, let's say even if we're the most intellectual person, it doesn't mean we're the most charitable. Charity that our Lord Jesus Christ has surpasses all knowledge. Sometimes we wonder, Jesus, what are you doing? Why don't you just let go of that person? I can imagine the angels in heaven when they look at us and all of our sins and we've gone to confession one thousand times and, and still Jesus is there in the box. Jesus is there to absolve us one more time. And the angel's going, are you kidding me? Just let him go. He doesn't love you. Look how many times he's proven he doesn't love you. And it's not his way though. And every one of us is afraid of the confessional. Every one of us who's afraid of confessing a sin should never be so. It's the angels. If we were angels, that'd be a problem. But we're not. And we're not judged by the angels. We're judged by the sacred heart of Jesus. The sacred heart of Jesus will pursue us until we die. So you look at the Epistle and Gospel again of today or of the third Sunday and you make that comparison. St. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians um, he pretty much spells it out and then if it's not this epistle it's the epistle of St. Peter, the first letter of St. Peter they're like commentaries to the gospel. Don't, never forget that when you're reading your Sunday Missal feast day Missal, always look at the epistle coming from the church as a description, a commentary on the on the gospel. And you'll find out how to understand the gospel by the epistle. So here in the epistle of today's Mass, the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart, he says, that he may grant you from his glorious riches to be strengthened with power through his spirit and to the progress of the inner man. And to have Christ dwelling through faith in your hearts. So that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. So you have to be rooted, rooted and grounded in love to understand the things of heaven, to understand the, the saints, to understand our Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't mention this too much earlier today in the sermons, but you know, if you just look at the the <coughs> the meditation of Saint Ignatius on the love of God, called the Golden Staple because it holds everything together. The attainment of the love of God is the name of the contemplation or meditation. It's that mutual giving of self. We have to give something to Jesus and he's giving himself always to us. So it's really a cooperation. We have to cooperate with him. To know Christ's love, we, that's what we want, which is above all knowledge, in order that we might be filled with the fullness of God. The third part of the <clears throat> sermon is a little more practical, I would say. Uh, it's a few points that hopefully you can take and apply or live uh, to its fullest, hopefully. What we've talked about, what I've taught you about today and preached to you, 
is really summed up in these four points. So it's really almost five, but four important points and then the last overall point. And that is that we want to remain true devotees of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get a little, it's a little complicated and we get too distracted. So my first point to you is the word simplicity. Simplicity. We pray as we love. We will love as we pray. It's that simple. Learn to pray as you love. And then I'll be able to show, if, you, if you're a prayerful person, then I'll be able to tell you how much you love Jesus. And vice versa. So if we are not very good prayers at the moment, we can work on that. Then we know we'll love Jesus. Right? <clears throat> and vice versa. If we're not much of a lover of our Lord, of course we're not going to be praying very well need to work on that. Simplicity. Avoid complication. Avoid complications in your home and in your life. Pray as you love and love as you pray. Be simple in your spiritual life. Do not overburden yourself with devotions. Do what's necessary. And that's why there's such a variety, isn't there, amongst the faithful. We all know that we have to go from A to B, which is pretty much birth, baptism, to death, extreme unction. Those two end book ends of our life, with all the sacraments in between, everybody's the same. But not every life is the same. The means by which I go from here to there is different for so many people. As a fact, there's not a person in this room who is exactly the same means to get from A to B. So each one's unique. Each one has their own graces that God gives them, and situations, people, places, circumstances. And so you see how that could be seen to be very complicated. But I guess it's kind of complicated if we start thinking outside of our lane, as they like to say, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, you'll save your soul. Go from A to B with the means that God gave you. Sometimes we have to clarify that or fix it up a little bit. Maybe we're going outside and acquiring, involving ourselves in things we shouldn't be, that would be dangerous. Stay in your lane. Use the things that God has given you to sanctify your soul. Keep it simple. We pray as we love and we love as we pray. Do not overburden yourself. Mm -hmm. Secondly, endurance. Um, earlier today I asked the faithful to pray for those who get married. Because it's quite a burden to get married today and to persevere in that marriage. And then it's also very complicated and can be very difficult to maintain a little child that's just <laughs> baptized to maintain it in its innocence. That's, that's yeah. quite a treasure. A set of parents, godparents, pastors, who can preserve these little souls baptized into adulthood innocent, that's a challenge. And it takes a lot of effort. So we need to pray for that. And that's why it requires endurance. It requires perseverance, the big P word, as I like to call it, or the big E word, which is endurance. Your soul, all souls, must endure. I, I would want it to be the case, dear faithful, if you're, you're, you might very much love your family, you love your wife, you love your children, you love your brothers and sisters. Do you want them not to go to heaven? Wouldn't you want them to be with you in heaven? So if you ever see somebody failing, lacking, not enduring, you need to help them. Why would you just want to go on down the path by yourself and then, oh, forget those people? No, not if you love. Not if you have the spirit of the sacred heart. There's not a room, person in this room that I don't want to see in heaven. And I hope it's the same for you. I hope it's the same for everybody you work with, everybody you're related to. We don't want them to go to hell. We want them to go to heaven. We want them to be in heaven with us for eternity. Just so sad, although I won't be sad. If somebody wasn't there, one of my brothers, one of my sister, or my sister, or any relative. Unfortunately, it's the reality. We can't save everybody. They have to work at their own salvation. But that should be our desire. And, we, and that the spirit of endurance, if you want to endure down that track, it's like run a marathon. If you're on a team, you're running the marathon, mm -hmm. and somebody falls down, you help them up. You help them to get to the end. If 
you're a king. We have a special grace, and I want you to remember that also as Catholics. You have a special grace. There will be many perilous things around you, but you have the grace to endure. You have the grace to persevere to get to the end. That's the way God wants it. So why is it not going to be so? With this love of souls, which is the third point, we all need to have this love of souls. It really makes us missionaries. It's really the missionary spirit. All these things I give you, it's really the missionary spirit. People admire your life. You may not believe that. Sometimes they're always criticizing you or making fun of you as a Catholic. But they really do admire you. Just look how they, they do talk about you, make fun of you as Catholics. And why not just leave us alone? Go their own way. Stop picking at us. But they can't because there's something there that attracts them. Just like with our Lord. Just like with the Pharisees. The Pharisees could not let it go with our Lord. Always going back, what's he doing? Where did he go now? What did he say? What does it matter to you? We could say. But it does matter, doesn't it? <clears throat> so don't don't lose as, don't lose that aspect of that, of that uh, knowledge that even though we're we're desiring to love souls and we want souls to be saved and we want to have this missionary spirit like the Sacred Heart, and they seem reticent, they seem against us. There's something there that they admire. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother with us. <laughs> wouldn't bother with us. Joy. That's the other one that I need to tell you about, the other point. Um, something that you need. we all can work on, that you need to work on, joy. As a Catholic, I would not want you to be dour. If you're a Sacred Heart follower and you're a true missionary, you're joyful. Your joy must surprise many, and it does. I think it still does. The joy of Catholics, the joy of a mother who's raising eight to who knows how many kids, and she still smiles, uh, that impresses people. They'd be depressed, and they would say, what would, what would I do with my son? I said, no, 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 no. The mother who's raised in a family who could still be joyful and smile, that's a grace. That is a sign that the Sacred Heart is working with her. Depriving herself, she receives a perfect peace. The same for all of us. Whatever you end up giving up of yourself, you'll find a proportional peace. It's the way it works. Our Lord's the one who gives the joy, not us. So if you're joyful amidst all of your duties and trials and difficulties, that's a grace. It's a gift. And so we should strive for We should ask our Lord for that true joy. And it's no different from Our Lady. It's no different from the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then to sum it all up, all of that means, dear faithful, all of those points I gave you, from simplicity to joy, is really just an abandonment to divine providence. Jesus, what do you want from me? And that's what I'll do. It may come with its own cost, it's true, but it won't change what I'm doing. Simplicity, endurance, joy, etc. I am abandoned to you. Whatever you want me to do, whatever, however you want me to accomplish it, I'm here for you. So that's what really matters. Is how does God want this to turn out? How does He want it to look? It's all of our, you know, vacillation and pusillanimity, all of this, whatever it is that we bring to the table, which often looks very weak and very um, yes, sin-ridden. That doesn't matter. Ultimately. We're doing our best. We must do our best to abandon ourselves to divine providence. What does God want from us? It's the case in the church today. And that's why we must run to Our Lady in the political environments that we live in, the difficulties you have with family and so many different obstacles. You run to the Blessed Virgin Mary and you put all of your confidence in her. Because at the end of the day, when we're weakened and we don't have, we have half a mind and we're doing things wrong. We need to trust her. We need to give everything to her. And all of you who have made the consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, you're already in that state of giving everything to her so that the best benefit, the greatest fruits come from her, through her. Where we fail, she will not fail in taking us to the Sacred Heart of her Son. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.